This video was age-restricted and demonetized by YouTube the first time around, so I've re-edited it and hopefully you can watch it before YouTube buries it again. Peaceful liberation or violent conquest? That is the key question when it comes to the matter of China's occupation of Tibet. If you ask China, they will paint you a fictitious tale of peace and liberation, a tale that makes them the hero. You ask the Tibetans, and they will tell you a story of violent conquest. A story that has a lot of this. China wants to control Tibet for more reasons than one. In 1989, martial law was declared in Tibet. China crushed the movement. The Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader of Tibetan Buddhism, is today a dangerous separatist, and Tibetans should transfer their loyalty from him to the Communist Party. The first thing I say is we have to do something about China. First thing. The story of Tibet is one of the saddest stories in modern history. It's a story of oppression and the annexation of an entire nation under the cruel foot of the Chinese Communist Party. This might be a sad and controversial topic, but I hope that many people learn about the Tibetan plight and are enlightened to the cruelties of the Chinese Communist Party. This is a story of genocide, a story of cruelty, and the story of a broken, stolen nation, all under the hands of the CCP. For those that may not be familiar, this is Tibet. Nicknamed the Roof of the World for its towering peaks, Tibet is a nation lodged in the Himalayas. What's interesting, or uh, maybe rather sad, about this mountain nation is that Tibet is ruled by the Chinese Communist Party. Yes, that's right, the Tibet ruling government is based in Beijing, with local decision-making power concentrated in the hands of Chinese party officials. Tibet, according to every possible metric, is the least free country in the world. And this has been the case for a few consecutive years now. Given that it is its own country, but run by the CCP, makes this fact a little easier to understand. And let me tell you, if you think the CCP is merciless against its own citizens, then you best believe that they are brutal against other nations. The CCP is notorious for human rights violations against people of Tibetan ethnicity, denying them fundamental rights and suppressing any form of religious beliefs and cultural identity among the people. What was once an independent and self-ruling state has been reduced to little more than a region of China where the motherland constantly siphons resources. The CCP has even gone so far as to implement state policies, such as incentives for non-Tibetan people to migrate from other parts of China to Tibet, to dilute the population. They force the compulsory relocation of ethnic Tibetans in a bid to reduce the ethnic Tibetan share of the population over time. It gets worse, too. The persecution of Tibetans in their own country has reached extreme levels. The Tibetan language is even de facto almost outlawed. What the CCP has done is horrible and wrong. By all metrics, it resembles an attempt to eradicate an entire people. Even the Dalai Lama, regarded as the father of the Tibetan people, is compelled to live in exile in Dharamsala, India, just because of the constant CCP threats of assassination. The CCP is killing an entire group of people and the world is taking little to no notice. Maybe money truly talks, huh? The question now is, how did this all escalate to where it is today? How did China take over its neighbor, an independent sovereign nation, and start using it as a play area? Let me get into that right away. Again, this video is not likely to gain favor with the YouTube algorithm gods, so please take a minute to give it a like. Your support is valued in the pursuit of truth. As I said earlier, this exact video was demonetized and restricted by YouTube when I first uploaded it. But since this is an important topic, I decided to re-edit it and upload it again and hope it doesn't get buried again. Unfortunately, this is a very common occurrence on my channel. YouTube consistently demonetizes and restricts my videos. This is why I made a Patreon, where you guys can support the videos and watch uncensored versions. My videos wouldn't be possible without the support of my patrons, since the channel is mainly funded through your support. If you enjoy the videos, please consider supporting them by clicking the link below. 
The key challenge with Tibet is that China maintains that Tibet is and has always been a part of China. On the other hand, Tibet maintains that it is and has always been an independent nation. This key difference is everything. If China is right in saying Tibet is part of its territory, then this matter becomes a domestic issue outside of international jurisdiction. On the other hand, if Tibet is indeed a nation being illegally occupied, then, well, this becomes an international matter. Most nations turn a blind eye and cower behind the guise of domestic issues. This matter, however, is far from being a domestic matter. Let's dive into history and see just where China got it horribly wrong. You know it's a problem when the whole nation insists you are illegally occupying it, and only the invaders say they are in the right. See where you're getting it wrong, China? If we dig deep, we'll see that China's present claim to Tibet is based entirely on the influence that Mongol and Manchu emperors exercised over Tibet in the 13th and 18th centuries, respectively. Uh, yes, it's history lesson time. Remember the great Genghis Khan? Of course you do. Well, as his Mongol Empire expanded towards Europe in the west and China in the east during the 13th century, the Tibetan leaders of the Sakya school of Tibetan Buddhism agreed with the Mongol rulers to avoid the otherwise inevitable conquest of Tibet. Yes, yes, everybody was trying to strike a deal with Genghis Khan back then. They promised political allegiance and religious blessings and teachings in exchange for patronage and protection. The religious relationship became so important that when Kublai Khan, Genghis's grandson, conquered China and established the Yuan Dynasty, he invited the Sakya Lama to become the imperial preceptor and supreme pontiff of his empire. The relationship that developed and still exists today between the Mongols and Tibetans is a reflection of the close racial, cultural, and especially religious affinity between the two Central Asian peoples. That is where the CCP starts to get it wrong. To claim that Tibet became a part of China because both countries were independently subjected to varying degrees of Mongol control, as the CCP does, is absolutely ridiculous. The Mongol Empire, at its height, was a world empire, and therefore was bound to have their hands in every single cookie jar. Absolutely no evidence exists to indicate that the Mongols integrated the administration of China and Tibet, or appended Tibet to China in any manner. These are all baseless Chinese delusions. It's like claiming that France should belong to England because both came under Roman domination. It's ridiculous. From there, just like every other nation throughout history, Tibet had periods when they were subjected to foreign influence or rule, but none of them really seemed to stick. For the most part, Tibet maintained its independence. Let's jump to relatively recent history now. From 1911 to 1950, Tibet successfully avoided undue foreign influence and behaved, in every respect, as a fully independent state. The 13th Dalai Lama emphasized his country's independent status externally, in formal communications to foreign rulers, and internally, by issuing a proclamation, reaffirming Tibet's independence, and by strengthening the country's defenses. Tibet remained neutral during the Second World War, despite strong pressure from China and their allies, Britain and the US. The Tibetan government maintained independent international relations with all neighboring countries. The attitude of most foreign governments with whom Tibet maintained relations implied their recognition of Tibet's independent status. The British government bound itself not to recognize Chinese suzerainty or any other rights over Tibet unless China signed the draft Simla Convention of 1914 with Britain and Tibet, which China never did. Nepal's recognition was confirmed by the Nepalese government in 1949, and documents presented to the United Nations in support of that government's application for membership. For a while, it seems that the entire world recognized Tibet, except for China, which still stuck to some baseless points that delusionally gave them Tibet as an inheritance. For the most part, however, China's barks were fruitless. This all changed, however, in 1949, when matters became militant. China must have realized that it had better manpower, equipment, and war supplies. If you can't win a logical argument, then much like the playground bully, use force. This must have been China's thinking. And this year, a year that is marked by black in Tibet, 
the People's Liberation Army of China crossed into Tibet. As expected, they made quick work of the very small Tibetan force and soon moved to occupy the country. Once firmly settled in power, the CCP imposed the so-called 17-point agreement for the peaceful liberation of Tibet on the Tibetan government in May 1951. According to the CCP, they were liberating Tibet. From what exactly, who knows? However, any such agreements must be made in good faith, and because this agreement was signed under duress, the agreement lacked validity under international law. And to even call it duress is an understatement. The presence of 40,000 enemy troops in Tibet, the threat of an immediate occupation of Lhasa, Tibet's capital, and the prospect of the total obliteration of the Tibetan state left Tibetans with little choice. They had to sign. But what China never banked on was the amount of hate that victims can harbor towards their oppressors. Enter the Tibetan protests. What's going in Tibet right now? This is what's happening right now. Protests in Tibet. Border region of Tibet protesting. Chinese police and military forces crushed the protest. Estimates for those killed in the crackdown range from dozens into the hundreds. People's frustration bubbled over and some people shouted, revolt. Where is freedom of speech in China? Where is freedom of press in China? As the resistance to the Chinese occupation escalated, particularly in eastern Tibet, the Chinese retaliation, which included the destruction of religious buildings and the imprisonment of monks and other community leaders, increased dramatically. By 1959, a popular uprising culminated in massive demonstrations in Lhasa. In any other normal country, when people demonstrate, it means that there is a problem that needs amicable solutions. To the CCP, however, it was a challenge they could not tolerate. Their solution? Death. By the time China crushed the uprising, 87,000 Tibetans were dead in the Lhasa region alone, and the Dalai Lama had fled to India. In 1963, the Dalai Lama promulgated a constitution for a democratic Tibet. It has been successfully implemented, to the extent possible, by the government in exile. I mean, you can really only do so much when the national government has to be based in another nation, in exile. So, what has been the effect of decades of forced Chinese rule and brutality? Has Tibet finally succumbed? Well, no. Religious persecution, consistent violations of human rights, and the wholesale destruction of religious and historic buildings by the CCP have not succeeded in destroying the spirit of the Tibetan people to resist the destruction of their national identity. 1.2 million Tibetans have lost their lives at the hands of CCP brutality. Just so that I can put this into perspective for you, that is one in every six Tibetans. Imagine that level of brutality. Since March 2011, more than 150 people have set themselves on fire inside Tibet in protest against China's repression. From shouting, Tibet needs freedom in the street, to attending a mass protest, Tibetans resist China's policies daily. Despite 70 years of occupation, this resistance to China remains undiminished and widespread. The fire doesn't seem to be dying down, as the new generation of Tibetans seems just as determined to regain the country's independence as the older generation was. As emboldening as it is, the sad reality is, unless things change, there's a lot more death on the way. So, where does that leave us in the present day? The fact is, from a legal standpoint per international law, Tibet has not lost its statehood. It is an independent state that is under illegal occupation. Neither China's military invasion nor the continuing occupation by the army has transferred the sovereignty of Tibet to China. China is off here and its claims are based solely on the alleged subjugation of Tibet to a few of China's strongest foreign rulers in the 13th and 18th centuries? Maybe that did happen, but like most states that were under foreign influence, Tibet finally got their freedom. Robbing them of it now is an action done by the lowest of the low. The ambassador of Ireland to the UN has said during the General Assembly of Tibet, for thousands of years, for a couple thousands of years at any rate, Tibet was free and as fully in control of its own affairs as any nation in this assembly. 
and a thousand times more free to look after its own affairs than many of the nations here. The international community knows that there is gross injustice being done. But because of China's influence and power, this is being regarded as a domestic matter. But the truth is, it's not. No one wants to risk the wrath of the Chinese economic machine, and because of that, Tibet is suffering. It is time that the Tibetan nation governs itself. It is time that the international community stops turning a blind eye to the genocide and injustice of the Tibetan people. It is time that this plight starts echoing louder and louder.